final week of The Cure. Uh, all right, hey, happy Sunday. So good to be together. Thanks uh, to all of our friends live here at the City House for braving uh, the elements. You know, it's, uh, snow is really fun when you're a kid. And then you become an adult, and you're like, oh, wait, this is actually the worst. But I will say that uh, it was a beautiful snow. And I do appreciate that, especially it helps get me in the Christmas spirit. So thank you for braving the elements, hanging out with us, to our church family online. Appreciate you tuning in. Uh, as a, just a quick reminder, we're going to be taking up our kingdom offering uh, part two at the end of service today. And so uh, for those of you who are wanting to give, and uh, man, if you haven't yet, and then you're hearing what God did in Nicaragua and not compelled to, wow, that was uh, absolutely incredible. And it's just, it's been really amazing. And I just want to say, like, I've had the privilege of, I've got to hear from Matt and Christopher hearing their story. And I get a, uh, we're in a, a year-long Leaders Made discipleship program with these guys. And just to see how they've grown as men, to see how they've grown in their confidence, their willingness is, like, incredible. And so I just want to say I'm proud of you two in particular. Like, it's inspiring for me uh, to watch you step out in faith and be real difference makers. And so thanks for doing that. I wasn't planning on giving uh, an applause coming for you guys, but uh, receive it because you're awesome. So we're in week uh, number three, a third and final week of a series that we're calling The Cure, where we've been hanging out in Matthew chapter six, and it is a rich chapter of scripture. We've called it a generosity series, uh, and it'd be easy to think when you hear generosity series that it's just about money, but man, it is about so much more. Throughout this series, we've looked at three different soul sicknesses and the corresponding cure. Because the amazing thing about the Bible is even though it was written, depending on the old and the new, thousands and thousands of years ago, uh, it really touches on the same struggles that we face as humanity today. And not only does it highlight the struggle, it always provides the answer. And it gives us the wisdom, the living wisdom that we need to navigate any challenge that we face in our everyday lives. And that's what this series is really all about. These soul sicknesses that we've been unearthing and then also identifying the corresponding cure. In week one, Jordan did an incredible job and he talked about the soul sickness of impure motives. We live in such a bizarre window in human history. Right, We live in the world, it's the digital age, it's the era of social media where nothing is real, everything is plastic, everything is phony, we are hypersensitive to anything that seems inauthentic and disingenuous, and then we also have to navigate that inwardly. We have to also ask the difficult questions of like, why is it that I do the things that I do? Do I do the, is there an altruistic spirit or, or am I really just doing good stuff to satisfy and serve myself? And it gets really complicated and difficult to discern and to navigate. And, and Jordan, he helped through the words of Jesus show us the cure of knowing whether we have pure motives or impure motives. And Jesus says, give in secret. It's this idea that live your life in a way where you refuse to be the hero. Live your life in a way that you don't uh, run after a platform, but yet you reluctantly accept platforms when they're given to you. G live in a way where you receive no credit, no glory, no praise, but let all of that go to God. And in doing so, we can safeguard our own hearts. We are not the heroes in the story. Jesus Christ is our hero. How many of you know that to be true? Yes. He's the hero. And if we just keep reminding ourselves where we live in this day and age where uh, everyone thinks they're the main character, you're not. Okay? We're supporting roles, and that is very, very good news for us. Then last week, we looked at the second soul sickness, and it was this sickness of living your entire life and investing your kingdom here on earth. That this window of time, this 76.8 years on average that we have breath in our lungs, it is 
nothing in comparison to eternity. I use the example, it is the cup of water in comparison to the ocean. So don't live for the cup. What a travesty to get to the end of our lives and realize that we have given everything for the here and now, but we live with eternally mind, uh, minded people. We live with eternity in mind. There's, that's what I was going for. And, and we, we keep our mind focused on eternity. And that's the, the cure is that we don't invest riches in the world. We invest riches in heaven with our time, our most valuable commodity, our gifts, and yes, also our resources, which then leads us to today. Soul sickness number three, I think one that all of us can relate with in some fashion, and it is the soul sickness of worry and anxiety. And it's with that said, we're going to jump right into our text this morning, Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse number 25. And Jesus says this, Therefore, I tell you, oh, get this. You want to know what to do? Do not worry about your life. Right out of the gate, Jesus says something amazing. For those of you here that your life is consumed and you are crippled by worry and anxiety. Good news. Already, Jesus has given us two amazing principles. The first thing he shows us is that his desire for you is that you would live a life free of worry. Like, that's what he wants. That's what he desires. These are his hopes and his aspirations, that you would live a life with 0% worry. And if the first is true, then logically the second has to also be true, that it's possible. That not only does he want this for you, desire this for you, hope this for you, but it's also possible to achieve a life free of worry. He says, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? He's showing us that that this is where the world lives, that the rest of the world will live under this preconceived idea that life is found here in food and drink and stuff and experiences. And he's saying, don't be fooled. Don't fall into the trap because there's no life here. There's nothing there that can satisfy your soul in any way. The world will think that life exists there, but we will think differently. You know, for me, when I read my Bible, I find that it's always helpful to start by asking the question, why? So why is it? It's cool that Jesus doesn't want me to worry. That's awesome of him. But why? Like, why does he tell me not to worry? And I think the obvious answer to that is because he he cares for us. He wants the best for us. He doesn't want us to suffer. He doesn't want, he's not cruel or like malicious. He doesn't want us to to carry this weight that's crushing. He cares for us. Because think about for a moment just the, the negative effects of worry in our life. In fact, let's try something together, shall we? How many of you are like a pros and cons list type people? Like when navigating decisions, uh, you make a little list. So let's, uh, let's play around with that, shall we? So, Worry. We'll look at this objectively together. We will start with the cons. And then we'll get over to the pros here in a minute. So, the cons of worry, the first one, and this is amazing, they've had all this like data and science come out, is come to find out worry is extremely detrimental to our, uh, our health. Incredibly bad. And this is just physically speaking. Uh, it, it messes with our nervous system. We have these, these special cells. They're called neurons. And when we're overcome with worry, they release a stress hormone. And it causes like our heart rate to increase. It can cause our, 
our blood pressure to rise. Not only that, worry causes our muscles to tighten up, but like not in a good way, not in the way that you go to the gym for. <laughs> like it, we get all real tense and it can lead to stress headaches and it can even lead uh, to migraines. Worry also terrible for your heart. Increased blood pressure. They've even drawn and found correlations between worry and heart attack, even a stroke. Scary stuff. And not only that, but worry can damage your immune system. It's like a, a virus in a computer. When we're worried, it prohibits our body's natural ability to fend off uh, viruses and different uh, diseases and sicknesses. It's uh, bad news bears, not good stuff. In addition to detrimental to our health, uh, worry, if we're just being honest, it causes us to treat others poorly. Now, if you're a worrier yourself, maybe you know uh, an incessant worrier, they're always on edge they're always stressed out. They always live with a really short fuse and just could kind of freak out out of nowhere. This is what worry does to us. Another huge con of worry is that it wastes time. Someone mentioned it earlier, our most valuable commodity. We can always go earn more money, can't make more time. It wastes time. And here in just a few moments, Jesus will challenge us. And he'll say, who of you by worrying can add a single hour to your life? And the answer is none of you. Chumps? Nobody. It's wasteful. It's all for naught. Two more. Just because we're running out of room. Worry. It robs you of joy. It is amazing when you go on a missions trip. It is amazing when you go to places in a third world context, oftentimes in abject poverty. It is startling to us in a Western first world reality how joyous these people are. And we, we don't have any understanding. We don't have a category for it. Because for us, our stuff is a blessing but then we realize, oh wait, is the more stuff I have means the more that I worry? Was it Jesus who said, mo money, mo prob? No, no. <laughs> but like, something to that, huh? So wait, you guys have nothing and yet you're full of joy. Huh. And we find ourselves, we just, we always worry we have so much, and we're just always worried. And because of that, we have no joy. And lastly, and definitely not least, in fact, potentially most significant, is that worry, it steals away our ability to trust God. Because that's what worry is. Worry is a declaration, subconsciously, implicitly, to God that, hey, I've got this. I'm good. I'm, I'm in control. That, that I'm going to take care of this. And that's why we carry it. So those are the cons. So let's, uh, let's take a moment and talk through all of the pros, the advantages of worry. So for starters, you have... Um, Well, when you really, when you stop and think about it, you, huh, come to find out that worry benefits our life in no perceivable way, that worry only hurts us, never helps us. That when it comes to worry, there is only a net loss, never a net gain. And this is why Jesus says, don't worry. He continues on. Verse 26. 
He says, look at the birds of the air. We got any bird watchers here today? Good for you. <laughs> look at the birds of the air. Show offs. Birders, that's a term for you guys. Or a word I just learned between services, ornithologists. How's that? Um, so for those of you who like to watch birds, a.k.a. have too much time on your hands, <laughs> why is Craig picking on the bird watchers? All right, verse <laughs> look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap. They don't store away in barns. And yet, your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Guys, what, what Jesus is showing us here, and this is huge. He's saying, for some of us, like our worry, it's directly connected to a poor understanding of our own immense value in God's eyes. He's saying, like, don't you realize how important you are? Like, do you get that? Like, if you had only a fraction of the understanding of how deeply loved and valuable and like how cherished you are in the eyes of your father, you would never worry another second of your life. He's saying, if God cares even for the birds, if God cares even for the barn swallows that much to my own chagrin build nests all over my house and poop on everything. The invasive barn swallow that in Craig's mind is literally worthless. That it is so good for the barn swallow community that I do not own a BB gun. If God cares even for them, the annoying barn, how much more does he care about you? Someone who carries like the Imago Dei, someone who's made in his image. How much more does he care about you who he calls son or he calls daughter, who he knows by name. He knows every detail, the numbers of hair on your head. If he cares for the birds, how much more does he care for his own Children, Jesus is showing us when we begin to tap into our own immense value, how loved we are, how seen we are by the Father, it frees us from the burden of worry. Because a good dad provides for his kids. A good dad knows the needs of his kids. But as a side note, verse 26 is not a justification for laziness. Because, yes, the birds don't worry, but the birds do work. And they work hard. And so we're called to work. We're called to simultaneously work and produce, yet live free of worry. And once again, it's possible. Jesus continues, verse 27. He says, can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? And the answer, obviously, is no. In fact, the opposite is true. Not only does worry not add time, it robs us of time. One scholar said it this way, that there may be worse sins than worry, but none more wasteful. And that's all it does. It just wastes away our lives. And he says, why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They don't labor. They don't spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and thrown in the fire. Guys, God even cares for the grass. All of us, at some point in our life, you've taken grass and thrown it into a fire. You've taken weeds and thrown it into a fire. And it just 
erupts, and then two seconds later, it's gone. God cares even for that. That's how deeply connected the creator is to his creation. If he cares even for the grass, how much more does he care for you? And then Jesus Christ and his wisdom and his infinite knowledge he gives us the root of the problem for those of you that you are you're captive to worry that you're a slave to worry that it's stolen away your joy it's it wastes away at your time it has affected your health if you're curious as to the root of the problem read the next four words with me you ready you of little what Jesus Christ believes that when we trace worry back to its origin, it is always an issue of faith. It is always a problem that we view our problems so big and our God as so small. That we have poor theology around the power, the sufficiency, the sovereignty, and the true, awesome nature of who God really is. At the end of the day, it's a problem of faith. And because of that, this is what I want us to understand. Worry thrives where faith lacks. Do something for me. Just close your eyes for a minute. And the beauty of closing your eyes is it just eliminates any distractions. And I want you to think for a moment. What's the thing that you worry about more than anything? What's the thing you are so anxious over, you're so stressed about? It just, oh, whenever this is in my brain, I'm just worrying. It is probably the greatest source of worry in your life. For some of you, maybe it's your kids, maybe it's your job, maybe it's your finances. Maybe it's uh, your physical health. Maybe it's um, an addiction, a bad habit, a relationship. What is the thing that is the source of your greatest worry? Now, I want you to open your eyes. I've just done, actually done a huge favor for you because what I've helped you identify is the area of your life that you trust God the least. In fact, thinking back to our pros and cons list, if there is one benefit, one advantage of worry, it would simply be that it is a powerful and frustratingly accurate diagnostic tool. Worry shows you exactly where we do not trust God. Because we're telling God, I got this. Hey, this is a cross that I'm going to carry. This is a weight that I can handle. And so we worry and we waste. Where worry thrives, faith lacks. Verse 31. Jesus says, so do not worry. Do you, are you starting to identify the repeating theme here? Worry bad don't do it. So don't worry. Saying, well, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the who? The pagans. For those without God. For those who live as their own Lord. For those who live on the wide road that leads to destruction. They run after these things. But the wonderful reality for us this morning is that our Heavenly Father knows what we need. That He sees, maybe your earthly father wasn't present, but your Heavenly Father is. Maybe your earthly father didn't see, but your Heavenly Father does see. He knows not what you think you need. He knows what you really need. 
that the world will always run after X, Y, and Z, and it will be bigger, better, and more. And yet, we will be dumbfounded when we go to Nicaragua and they're happier than we are. When they have nothing and have joy, therefore have everything. The world believes that this is where life is, but the Father knows what we need. And then, Jesus gives us the cure. He says, but, everyone say, seek first. His kingdom and his righteousness and all of these things will be added to you as well. I don't know about you. I'm a simple guy. I love a simple cure. I love a simple solution. Do you want to be set free from the crippling worry, from the crushing anxiety? Do you want to be set free from the worry that has damaged your health, wasted your life, and stolen away your joy? Jesus says, here's the answer. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and you will be set free. Here's the problem, though, for some of us, is we don't know what that means practically. That sounds really good on stage, right? That will be awesome in a worship song, but, but how do I do that? How do I live this out? And it's so simple, not easy, simple. Seeking first the kingdom of God means this, that you put God first in every area of your life. Do you want to find someone that lives with no worry? You will find someone who puts God first in every area of their life. If you hear anything I say, I want you to hear this. When we put God first, everything else is taken care of. This is what Jesus believes. This is not what Craig is telling you. This is not what Craig is trying to convince you of. This is what Jesus Christ is saying. That when we put God first, everything else in your life will fall into perfect alignment. And there, your needs will be met. There, you can find joy. And there, you will live free. Every area. And it's a, it's a universal principle. Literally, apply it to anything. Oh, well, what comes first? My work or God? Put God first. And watch what happens to your work. If you put your work first, oh man, that could get really, really bad. And really toxic, really quick. You can so easily begin to find your identity in what you do. But when we put God first, you'll actually become, I'm convinced, a better employee. Convinced of it. Colossians 3, one of my favorite passages in all the Bible. It says, whatever you do, do it with all of your heart. Not for like human masters, not for like human bosses. Pretend as though it's the Lord Christ you're serving. That's what it says. I haven't met your boss. Maybe he's awesome or she's awesome. Or maybe she or he is the worst. I don't know. But I do know this, when you show up to work and you work as someone that the Lord Christ is the one that you are serving, you will work differently. And you will have a deep sense of joy and purpose in whatever you do. I can tell you this, building houses in Nicaragua is not glamorous work, but I can tell you it was deeply rewarding and fulfilling for these guys. It'll change your work, put God first. Oh, my money or God, what comes first? Put God first. Step out in faith. I'm a huge believer. 20 years I've lived this way. I've always put God first in, in my finances, and I have lived free in those areas. Does it mean that we've always had this massive abundance? No, but I've, always, I've had joy, and my basic needs have always been met. Step out in faith. Put him first. Step out. Tithe. Give him the first fruits of what you bring in. The first fruits are always scary because you don't know if the second, third, or fourth fruits are coming. 
but that's what he asked for. And then we step into the blessing. I love how Jordan said it in week one. There's a blessing in living in God's obedience and his favor. In my marriage, do I put God first or, or, or you know, spouse? Like, put God first. And in doing so, you'll become an incredible spouse. As you put him first and the fruits of the spirit become evident in your life, you're more loving and joyous and peaceful and patient and kind and self-controlled. Like, that sounds like a freaking awesome spouse. And also one who will not be cold at night. No? Okay. First service like that joke. I think at the end of the day, though, it just kind of boils down to... Uh, like, do we really trust God? That's what Jesus believes. Of ye of little faith. It's scary to walk by faith. I don't want to just give platitudes. It's scary to walk by faith. It's hard. <laughs> do you know why? <laughs> because it requires faith. It requires trusting in things that you can't see. It requires at times like you're going to feel like a crazy person. Like, what am I doing? This makes no sense. And that we have to continue to remind ourselves that God's a good father. That he knows my situation. He knows my needs. And may we not commit the sins and fall into the traps and believe the lies as the rest of the world. That life does not exist in the abundance of things. That life is more what are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? What experiences will we have? What more things will we accumulate? It's more than that. Seek first the kingdom. Seek first the righteousness of the kingdom. And everything that you need will be granted. Do we believe that? And so we're going to have a chance to uh, put part of this in action. And that's my encouragement to you. Like, think back on that thing. When you closed your eyes, like, what was the thing you worry about the most? And this is my homework for you. This is the actionable piece. How can you put God first in that area? Maybe it was the financial piece. Trust God. Begin to tithe. Watch what happens. Never in my 18 years of ministry have I ever heard the statement, I'm so, I'm just like, I regret tithing. I regret tr trusting God. So dumb. I've never heard that before. I have heard, man, that car was a really dumb purchase. <laughs> Shouldn't have done that. Didn't need another PS5. <laughs> like, I've heard all those. I just haven't heard like, man, I trusted in God and just really failed me, man. No, I just... Maybe for you, like your kids are the area of, what would it look like for you to put God first in the area of your kids? Realizing that you're not their God. You can't save them. You can't change them. But maybe instead of worrying, you get on your face and you pray to the God who can. Every day. Put God first. Maybe work. Work is the thing. I don't know. I don't know. I... Show up, and it's the Lord Christ that is your boss tomorrow morning. You'll work different. How can you put God first in those areas? Replace worry with faith, and you will live with, you will live with joy and freedom. And so we're going to have a chance to give our Kingdom Builders offering. For those of you, we didn't uh, give last week, and we're going to give this week. And I'm so grateful that we get to do that. I'm so proud that we get to give. I was just reminded of this when I was hearing the stories of the team in Nicaragua. Are you guys curious, like, what it looks like when the kingdom of heaven shows up on earth? Are you ever curious about that? It looks like a lot of different things, but I can say this. One example of that is in a small village of Nicaragua where now just because people love Jesus, they pay women instead of selling their body, they pay them to learn about Jesus. That's one way that that looks like. One way it looks like practically when the kingdom of heaven shows up is when they advocate for single mothers. 
so they can get an education. One way is that when people don't work, some won't get paid for a week because they went to a country for someone they didn't know to build the house so they would no longer be homeless. That's what happens when the kingdom of God comes to the earth. And that's what we have the, the ability to be a part of. Not everyone can go to Nicaragua, but everyone can give. And everyone can do our part. And so I'm going to pray, and we're going to have the opportunity to do just that. Father, we thank you, Lord. Father, I just pray there would be just a, a sense of your goodness, a sense of your grace and your peace. Not a weight, but just this lightness, this... Uh, soft, gentle comfort, this reassurance that you're a good dad and you love your kids. That there be no guilt, no shame, nothing. That we would just be so reminded of your love. We would be so reassured that you are for us and not against us. That you want the best for us. That everything we're worried about, God, you already know. In fact, your word even says when we pray, everything we say, like, you, you already know it. At the end of the day, it's faith. And I pray that we would have a faith that's more than just, we're going to show up at church and worship and hear a positive message so that way we can leave feeling better about ourselves. But I pray that it would be a faith that we would genuinely lay down our lives, that we would genuinely believe that you are in control, that you've got it, that nothing will happen today outside of your hand. And because of that, we can just this deep sigh of relief we can stop playing the role poorly of Lord over our lives and we can just trust in you that we would be people of great faith not little faith so Father I pray that you would speak to us right now and show us those areas where you're just not first and you refuse to play second fiddle Show us the areas that you are not first, that we might instantly in this moment repent of those things and reestablish you as number one. Because God, when you're first, everything else will work out. We love you, God. Thank you. We pray that what's about to happen in this place would make you smile. We refuse to put our trust in the things the world will seek after. There's no life there put our trust in you. We love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's go ahead and give.